Hollywood loves playing with your mind. For two hours, they can make you believe in almost anything, even time travel. But could Hollywood fiction actually become a worldly fact? The invention of a real time machine would probably be the most important thing in the history of the world, in the history of man. Scientists are now teetering on the edge of making the impossible a reality. This century, I feel, will be seen as the century of time travel, just as the 20th century was seen as the century of space travel. Is he joking? Is he nuts? Or is he right? You're about to see time travel move from fantasy to the brink of reality. If you think Hollywood can play with your mind, you ain't seen nothing yet. Imagine life in America about a hundred years from now. Some things will be exactly the same, like school field trips. There'll be kids running around, out in the fresh air, getting excited about a visit to the museum. Come here. Okay, listen, guys. We've got a lot to get through today, okay? Shh. So keep close together. No wandering off. Now come with me. But some things in the future could be drastically different especially if the scientists of today have their way. If the theories and experiments you're about to see actually bear fruit, this imaginary museum could be a very real and very popular attraction. Strange as it may seem, this is not beyond the realm of possibility. Future school children may look back on the 21st century as the era when we learned how to master time. So here it is, the Museum of Time Travel. So this museum was built on the site of the very first successful time machine. And we're gonna find out later why that makes it so very special. But for now, the first step on our journey is to have a look at the past. Imagine what it was like over a century ago, in an age where the future was uncertain and the past a bit of a mystery. Our fascination with time travel always begins with a fantasy, a compelling dream of visiting another era. Imagine, for example, traveling back to 1912 and saving thousands of lives by simply giving a warning about a giant iceberg. The captain of the Titanic could have simply veered away. Or how about visiting Germany in 1938 and assassinating Adolf Hitler? You could stop World War II from ever happening. Tinkering with history is easy to imagine, but it's a bit trickier to grasp the basic truths about time itself. Time is the weirdest thing. You cannot see it, you cannot touch it, you cannot smell it. And yet it rules our lives with absolute control. We are all carried along in the present. We're trapped in this moment that we call now. Well, at least we were, until the efforts of these great minds freed us from the tyranny of time. Last century's scientific hero was Albert Einstein. But what about this century? Who will take Einstein's theories to the next level? Most thought that time travel would never be possible for real. But way back in the early 21st century, one man has an idea. His name is Ronald L. Mallet. One day, Ron Mallet might be seen as the true pioneer. He believes he's very close to the ultimate prize, a real working time machine. It's the culmination of a lifelong quest that began with an untimely death. The reason I became interested in time travel was my father. Uh, he was really a terrific person, and 
I loved him very deeply, and he died of a heart attack when he was only 33, and I was 10 years old, and I was devastated. It turned my world upside down. Science fiction became the young boy's salvation. In it, he found the hope that he needed to overcome his grief. I thought, what if I could build a time machine and go back into the past? Then I would be able to see him again and maybe save his life. So that became my goal, to build a time machine. As Ron grew up, he began to study science as well as science fiction, discovering a natural talent for the subject. Fast forward 40 years, and the young boy with the impossible dream is now a professor of physics at the University of Connecticut. He's an expert in the one branch of science that allows him to tinker with time. The journey has certainly been worthwhile, and the fruits of his labors are tantalizingly close. I feel that with current technology, it's possible at the very least to send subatomic particles back into the past. The professor's confidence is well-founded. He recently published this paper, which outlines his principle. His peers reacted with enthusiasm. We've known for a long time that time travel is possible in theory. What we've never known is how to do it. But what Mallette has come up with here is a means to achieve it. He's got a blueprint for a time machine. Physicist and writer Dr. Michael Brooks is well aware that sending particles back in time would also allow information to take the same route. Then things would get really strange. The implications of time travel are truly amazing. If we could send information back from the future, then we could win the lottery, for example, every week. Um, we could manipulate the stock market if we wanted to. But what's really astounding is that we could send back scientific understanding from the future. That hardly bears thinking about. This paper could revolutionize the world and shatter the barriers between past, present, and future. Although the professor's idea is new, the underlying science is not. In fact, the first steps were taken a long time ago, not in the form of a scientific paper, but a fictional book. Now, this next exhibit features Simon Wells, who's the great-grandson of the man many call the original father of time travel. My name's Simon Wells. My great-grandfather was H.G. Wells. In 1895, he wrote a very famous book called The Time Machine. And early in the 21st century, I made a movie out of that book. Do you want to take a look? The Time Machine was not just another good book. It was a work of fiction that inspired reality. It's the story of a Victorian scientist who tries to go back in time to prevent the murder of his fiancée. He discovers he can do nothing to change the past, but he can see the future. So he travels forward in time to witness what becomes of the human race. When it was published, the book immediately seized the public's imagination, including scientists, and so it inspired the first breakthrough in the real science of time travel. The breakthrough was to treat time as a fourth dimension, a dimension in which it may be possible to travel, just like traveling across a city. Imagine Professor Millet gets an invitation to a meeting in New York City. Thanks. To make sure he gets to the meeting, the invitation must have a number of pieces of information on it. First, he needs a street number. Since New York is laid out on a grid, that number will give him a position in the north-south direction. Next, he needs the avenue. In this case, Fifth Avenue, which gives him a position in the east-west direction. So far, he has found the unique location of the meeting in two directions, or dimensions. 
Now he needs another piece of information to tell him where the meeting is in the third dimension. But of course, the position in three dimensions is not enough to make sure he gets to the meeting. The invitation must also carry a fourth piece of information, the time. Four pieces of information specifying a single event in four dimensions, three of space and one of time. So here is a single event in space and time, or as scientists call it, space-time. Treating time as a dimension means that scientists can not only consider time travel logically, they can also explain why it seems so utterly confusing to us. Suppose that there is a world that has only two dimensions, like this piece of paper, and that there are beings that can only live in this two-dimensional world. They can conceive of length and width, but they cannot conceive of the third dimension, height. What would they make of a three-dimensional object like this paper clip if I introduced it into their world? To them, it will appear as though the object came out of nowhere. They can't conceive of the fact that it came from a third dimension. And if I pull the object back out of their two-dimensional world into the third dimension, to them, it will have appeared to vanish. In just the same way as a creature from a flat world would see a three-dimensional object doing the impossible, we three-dimensional humans would see a traveler in the fourth dimension do some very strange things. They could appear, vanish, then reappear, quite literally, some other time. And that's not the only strange thing that happens. If I fold this piece of paper over and push the single paper clip through, the people in this world will see this one object in two places. Thanks. That's why time travel, which is travel in the fourth dimension, allows someone to be in two places at once. If a professor could travel back in time, he could be the one who gave himself the invitation to the meeting. It sounds strange to us, but that's because we're not used to seeing travel in higher dimensions. This sort of thing was the very reason why time travel was thought to be impossible. But as we know, it's not. And in fact, as early as the 1970s, people have been traveling in time just by getting on board a primitive chemical rocket. Not many people realize it, but human beings have already traveled through time, just not the way you've seen it done in Hollywood. This is what makes time travel possible, the flux capacitor. Flux capacitor? In the movies, time travel is usually invented by a crazy professor who builds an even crazier machine. But in reality, there's already a way to take a shortcut to the future. All you need to do is travel very, very fast and for as long as possible. For example, if you were part of the Russian space program of the late 20th century, you would already be one of the world's first time travelers. This is cosmonaut Sergei Avdeyev. He holds the record for spaceflight, a total of more than two years on board the Russian space station Mir, which orbited at 16,000 miles per hour. Spending so long, going so fast, means that Avdeyev is also the current world record holder for time travel. He's been propelled a fraction of a second into the future. Most people think that time passes at a steady rate, no matter where you are or what you're doing. So a minute in New York is the same length as a minute in London or Paris or Tokyo or the moon for that matter. 
It's perfectly natural to think of time as being fixed, as if there could be a giant master clock for the whole universe, allowing us or any other civilization to agree on the one true time forever and ever. In fact, that's impossible. Time flows at different rates in different places. There are places in the universe where time slows down. And if you were to visit them, you would actually get old less quickly compared to the rest of us. This strange idea is the foundation on which Professor Millet will build his time machine. Hi, Chandra. Hey, how are you doing? Working with Chandra Roichaduri, an experimental physicist who specializes in laser technology, he hopes to create a machine that will use the principle of flexible time to send particles into the past. Please, now, basically what we're going to be looking at is trying to... Uh, time is not the same for everyone. Each one of us travels with our own individual clock, and there are things that you can do to change the rate at which your clock is going compared to someone else's, and that allows time travel. Although it sounds impossible, don't be fooled. This seemingly crazy notion is part of the bedrock of modern day science. In 1905, a 26-year-old by the name of Albert Einstein showed how space, time, and energy are linked. We know he got it right, because his theory led directly to the atomic bomb. This is the very same theory that should allow real, practical time travel. It all has to do with the speed of light. Now, let me tell you a bit about light. Light travels very, very fast, at about 670 million miles per hour. If a particle of light were to circle the Earth, it would do so nearly 10 times in just one second. Einstein's big idea was that the amazing speed of light holds the key to everything, from the untold power of the atom to the possibility of time travel. To follow in the footsteps of his genius, imagine the great scientist in a rocket ship, floating in deep space. The ship has powerful headlights, and when Albert switches them on, the light races away from him at, of course, the speed of light, 670 million miles an hour. Now imagine that Albert has a twin brother, Bertrand, who also has a spaceship. Let's say Bertrand flies away from Albert at half the speed of light. When Albert turns on his headlights, how fast would they seem to be going when they overtake Bertrand? You'd think he would see them pass by relatively slowly like a faster car passing you on the highway. But that's not the way light works. Instead, Bertrand would see Albert's high beams pass him at the full speed of light. Bertrand's own speed makes absolutely no difference. This prediction of Einstein that the speed of light is the same for everyone is one of the strangest in physics. But it's true. It's been shown by hundreds of experiments the speed of light is going to be the same, no matter how fast you're moving towards it or away from it. Even if Bertrand turns around and travels head on towards Albert, he would still see Albert's headlights pass him at the same speed. So what's going on? Welcome to the realm of time travel. If both brothers see light moving at the same speed, then something else must be changing. That something is time. Something has to give, and the things that have to give are space and time. It turns out that if an object is moving fast enough through space, it can alter its passage through time. This is the famous theory of relativity, and it means that time is not as fixed as a steady ticking clock would have you believe. It's actually flexible. The faster you're going, the slower time passes. The effect is not just theoretical. It has real, everyday implications. For example, a satellite that orbits the Earth at 20,000 miles per hour experiences two hundredths of a second less time per year than the rest of us down on Earth. 
the onboard computers are programmed to take this into account. Otherwise, the satellite's clocks would fall further and further behind clocks on Earth. If Bertrand's ship had some suitable equipment, we could see this mysterious effect for ourselves. This device is a light clock, two mirrors that face each other with a particle of light, or photon, bouncing between them. Each bounce is one tick of the clock, and in the right hands, such a clock shows directly how speed changes time. These ticks would normally occur millions of times per second, but we have slowed it down to show how this clock works and how the motion of it will affect the rate of ticking. You'll notice that the clock is ticking more slowly as I move it. Why is that? Well, the photon is making a zigzag path to reach one mirror and then the other. That's a longer path that the photon has to take. And that means that it takes more time to make that path. So the clock is slowing down. This is where physics and science fiction collide. Time for the moving clock runs slow. Although if you travel with it, like Bertrand, you're not aware of the change. That's because everything happening on board, including your heartbeat and your brain waves, would slow down by the same amount. The faster Bertrand travels, the further the photon has to go between ticks, and the slower time passes for him. So what might be an hour for Bertrand could be a hundred years for the rest of us. In effect, he would be traveling a hundred years into the future. Miss? Yes? What about travel to the past? Well... But then along came Professor Mallet. While jumping to the future is fairly easy, getting to the past is a different kettle of fish. And it's not just a question of physics. There are other reasons why such two-way time travel might not be possible or even desirable. At stake is nothing less than what it means to be a human being. On the face of it, traveling to the past is outrageous. Bob Gale co-wrote Back to the Future, the most successful time travel movie ever made. And he is well aware of the problems. If time travel were possible, then theoretically I could go back and visit my grandfather when he was a boy. Well, let's say I accidentally kill him. Then he doesn't grow up to get married and have my father. I don't get born. So the question is, if I don't get born, who was it that went back in time and accidentally killed my grandfather? It didn't happen, but it did happen, which is called a paradox. No matter what Ron Millett thinks is possible within the laws of physics, most people think that time travel must be impossible. The paradoxes seem too ridiculous to reconcile. Suppose that Simon Wells, the great-grandson of H.G. Wells, becomes fascinated by the idea of time travel after reading his ancestor's book and decides to travel back in time to 1894, just as H.G. Wells is trying to come up with the idea for his new novel. Let's say Simon tries to kill his great-grandfather to test the paradox. If you think about it, it must be impossible for me to go back and kill my great-grandfather because we all know it didn't happen. He lived to a ripe old age, he wrote hundreds of books, and I was born. So in the world that we live in, I can't change the past, even if I could travel in time. Something must go wrong. For example, the gun misfires and the murder attempt fails. So does that mean that time travel must be impossible? Well, not necessarily. As long as Simon Wells fails to kill H.G. Wells, there's no inconsistency. 
and no paradox. There's nothing to stop a time traveler from taking part in history, as long as the results of those actions agree with what actually happened. Let's suppose Simon Wells is caught by the police and is thrown in prison for attempted murder. His perplexed great-grandfather comes to the jail to find out who wanted to kill him. Simon tells him the whole story about how he reads the as-yet-unwritten book and travels back in time in an attempt to disprove the paradox. Of course, all is forgiven and Simon gets out of prison. But the intriguing possibility is that Simon Wells could have been the original inspiration for the book of the time machine, the book that started the whole thing off in the first place. He could, in effect, have played a role in the past. The implications are so far-reaching, it's almost inconceivable. Take the great-grandfather paradox. I can't kill my great-grandfather, even if I intend to. So whatever my intentions are, things will happen to stop me achieving them. Therefore, perhaps, I really have no free will and everything is predestined. A time traveler could go into the future, come back, and describe exactly what the future holds for each and every one of us. From birth to death, our lives would be predestined, as immovable and unchangeable as the past. We would lose the concept of responsibility for our actions, good or bad, with potentially appalling consequences for society. Thankfully, some believe that science itself offers a way out of this unpleasant prospect. Free will is pretty fundamental to our philosophical conception of ourselves as people. But it turns out that free will and time travel are not inconsistent with each other. But to understand why, we have to investigate some pretty strange features of reality. Professor David Deutsch is an influential physicist and writer, and he's the world's leading proponent of something called parallel universe theory. The theory is that in addition to the universe we see around us, there are vast numbers of other parallel universes. Some of them are very like our own, differing perhaps only in the position of one atom. And others are very different. For instance, there are universes in which I'm sitting at home watching TV now, and you're being interviewed about parallel universes. This bizarre idea comes from the study of subatomic particles. The more we find out about them, the more their behavior seems absurd which could actually begin to explain how the future is not fixed, but fluid, in a weird sort of way. If you look at the universe on a very small scale, you begin to see things that are very alien to our everyday experience. Um, in everyday life, um, we're used to objects retaining their identity as they move along. This pen stays a pen as it moves. Um, a subatomic particle typically might change into another particle or into two other particles, or particles might merge their identity and become one. Imagine that our universe is like a pool table. Usually, the balls follow the familiar laws of physics to the letter, laws that were laid down by Sir Isaac Newton over 300 years ago. But if we shrink the game down to the subatomic level, strange things start to happen. Sometimes a subatomic particle can be traveling along and then change course for no reason that we can observe. Or, if this was the subatomic world, we could put an object on the table and it could ooze right through and fall to the floor. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. This is the strange world of quantum mechanics, and physicists still argue about what exactly is going on. David Deutsch's answer is almost as strange as the problem. What's really happening is that the universe we see is only part of physical reality. There are parallel universes, 
and each particle in our universe has counterparts in many of the parallel universes. And under some conditions, these counterparts affect the particle that we can see. The universes are interfering with each other all the time. So particles in our universe could be hitting other particles in another universe, and neither universe would really know about it. And in that parallel reality, a very different scenario could be playing out, which means that time travelers could do pretty much whatever they wanted. Imagine a ball gets pocketed, and suddenly travels back in time, back where it came from. It's threatening its own history, a pool ball version of the grandfather paradox. If there is only one universe, something must prevent it from interfering, because we already know that it didn't hit the other balls. But in a multiple universe, something else happens. Time travel allows the ball to move between two different games, played in two slightly different universes. In one, the ball simply disappears forever, never to be seen again. And in the other, the ball appears from nowhere and disturbs the others. Because this is not the universe it came from, there's no need for it to fulfill any particular destiny. So neither universe contains a paradox. In fact, the theory implies that there are an infinite number of these parallel universes, and that time travel would simply involve skipping from universe to universe to universe. A working time machine would, in effect, test this extraordinary idea. If it's correct, then not only does free will exist, but the nature of reality itself is very strange indeed. As far as I'm concerned, the paradoxes that people talk about are only going to be resolved after we build the first time machine. Then we will know whether or not free will enters into it, whether there's multiple universes, or whether the universe is determined. That's going to have to be understood experimentally. Building a real time machine will not be easy, but if Millet is right, then the biggest revolution mankind has ever seen will be upon us and sooner than you might think. 1.21 gigawatts! Great Scott! What? what the hell is a gigawatt? Although Back to the Future was right about the difficulty of time travel, the very fact that physicist Ron Millette can even consider such a thing shows just how advanced our understanding of space and time really is. Remember, he wants to find a way to send subatomic particles into the past. It appears to be an outlandish idea, but Ron is not an outlandish scientist, and his peers are not laughing at him. 20 years ago, it would have been uh, close to professional suicide, but because of the fact that there is an enormous amount of articles serious research articles in the professional journals about time travel and time machines it's no longer considered to be part of the backwater it's considered to be at the forefront of research today so uh, I'm at the front line rather than uh, being ready to be institutionalized although Einstein correctly worked out that traveling very fast sends you into the future a further development of the theory should allow travel to the past even if it's only the odd particle or two, that would be a massive advance. If Ron Millet's experiments turn out as he hopes, then it would immediately put an end to the controversy about whether time travel would ever be practicable. Because although in his machine, we're going back in time really only with information or a couple of particles, nevertheless, the principle of the thing is what is at stake, and that is what would have been shown to be possible. So although, um, even in that most optimistic case, uh, we shouldn't be expecting practicable time machines to be in the shops anytime soon, we can be confident that one day in the distant future, they will be. You're about to see the very first steps into the potential of travel through the fourth dimension. This is the crux of the professor's long journey one that began many years ago as a boy simply wanting to see his departed father again. 
It starts with intensely powerful rings of laser light that twist time into a loop, an effect that Einstein predicted but was never able to prove. With a circulating beam of light, you create a rotating region of space as though you were stirring at a cup of coffee. In also, in addition to twisting space, in Einstein's theory, space and time are linked. So you cause a twisting of time as well. So if we think of time, our timeline as being a line from the past to the present to the future, if I can close that line into a loop, I can go from the past to the present to the future, but we're on a loop, so I can go from the future back into the past. It won't be simple, okay? Real world experiments aren't, but it will be able to be done. This is the basic form a time machine would take. A stack of lasers would create layers of circulating light, and around them would be circulating loops in time. Explaining this to kids might be something of a challenge, but in a future museum of time travel, one might start with a fictional character, loved by past generations, and probably future ones too. In the old movies, People often suggested one particular way to get to the past. All you have to do is exceed the speed of light. And there was this guy called Superman. Superman flew around the Earth at such a speed that he arrived before he left. And all this to save his girlfriend's life. Now, this may be impossible, but as often happens, fiction contains a grain of truth. And if somehow you could travel faster than light, you would travel to the past. In building a time machine, it appears that the ultimate challenge will be to find a way to cheat. How will we be able to exceed the speed of light, like Superman, but without breaking those tricky laws of physics? Luckily, we already have the answer, something that we know exists and we know where to find it. The problem is getting there. What you need is a rotating black hole. A black hole is a collapsed star which is so massive and condensed that at its core, not even light can escape. If the black hole is spinning, then it has a very interesting effect on the space and time around it. It drags them around with it. And that means that one can evade the rule about not exceeding the speed of light. A black hole is so dense that a single teaspoonful would weigh much more than the entire Earth. So the gravity it creates is incredibly strong, strong enough to grab the empty space around the black hole and pull it towards its center around and around, like water in a whirlpool. Here, on the edge of oblivion, physics is pushed to its absolute limit, which seems to be just the ticket for a little time travel. One can travel in towards the black hole and into the region where space and time are being dragged around with it, travel around with the black hole for a while and then emerge at a time earlier than when one went in. This natural time machine occurs only because the black hole has the power to move empty space. The phenomenon is called frame dragging, and it's one of Einstein's lesser known ideas. Within that rotating region of space, you can travel speeds up to the speed of light. But for someone that's standing outside, it would appear as though you're traveling faster than the speed of light, and for them, you will disappear from sight as you're traveling back into the past. Of course, there's a problem with this kind of time machine since black holes are not exactly readily available. However, this is where Ron had a stroke of inspiration. He realized that all along, Einstein's theory was hiding the secret, something that would be even better at twisting space than a black hole. It turns out that light is much more effective at twisting space and time. And so my idea is to use a circulating light beam to twist space and close time into a loop. The key technical challenge 
is trying to get enough laser power to cause this twisting of space and time. That's going to be the key challenge. And we're looking at several different possibilities to overcome that challenge. Modern laser technology is extremely advanced. Some lasers can create conditions as hot as the center of the sun. An array of such devices could be rigged to fire at the same time. And that could produce a cylinder of light with enough power to actually twist space. An elementary particle fired on a corkscrew-shaped path down this tunnel would wind its way into the past. Seen from outside, this experiment would have some pretty bizarre consequences. I expect that particles might just simply appear out of nowhere, even though I didn't put anything into the machine. And those would be particles that would be from experiments that I perform uh, next week or in a year from now in which I'm sending particles back to my time so that what I'm seeing are particles that I put into the time machine tomorrow or next year. But there is one inescapable drawback to this machine. No matter how powerful, Ron could never use it to reunite with his departed father. This is a real time machine. And that means that when you turn it on today, and you leave it on, it will only act during the time that you have it on. So if I turn it on today and I leave it on for 100 years, then I can travel from 100 years from now up to today, but I cannot travel before the machine was turned on. For me, the solace that I get from that is the fact that uh, I will have achieved this goal and it was inspired by my father. And I think that if he, you know, had lived, he would have been very proud of what I had been able to accomplish. So that gives me solace, that I will have accomplished an understanding of time and created a time machine. And uh, I will be able to live with that. We like to imagine a time machine as a gateway to the past, but that's not entirely true. It's only in the future that time travel to the past will be possible, and then only as far back as the moment the first time machine was activated. Otherwise, there's no place to materialize, so to speak. Of course, this brings up a very interesting question. What happens when you switch on the very first time machine? It's conceivable that when I turn the machine on, <laughs> I start getting messages from the future, from people who are trying to communicate with me. That would be a possibility. That would be weird, but it would, it's, it's definitely would be a possibility. The project to build the machine has only just begun. But should it succeed, the consequences are mind-boggling. If it could be stable enough to keep twisting time for a century or more, then it would become, in effect, a phone line through time. Anyone with future access to the machine could send messages back to Ron, which he'll begin to receive when he switches it on. Could this happen in our lifetime? Will reality catch up to fantasy? Now this, the very first time machine has been running ever since Professor Mallet first turned it on, over 100 years ago. He's probably too busy to answer it. Who wants to ask him a question? Please!